The question is, how did I ever become a musician? Well, my father had a nightclub. He had to speak easy during the late 20s and early 30s. And we used to have a floor show there uh, from New York. And uh, we had a three or four piece band. And I, I learned to play the saxophone with those great musicians that we had in the And they were there seven nights a week. And I became a bartender. I became a cook. I finally ended up as a dancer with my sister, and we were part of the floor show. So we're, I really, my father had a speakeasy all during the late 20s and early 30s. And he used to rum, he was like a rum runner, and he would go up to Canada and get the alcohol, and they'd come down and he'd put it in a vat and, you know, make a bathtub gin, beer, and all that kind of stuff. And that's how I started out. And then I, I couldn't stand it if there was World War II came around. And everybody was leaving. There was nobody. There was no one left in town. And in fact, I tried to get a couple of jobs playing my instrument, and they wouldn't hire me because they didn't like the way I played. <laughs> I was sort of like, brrr, brrr. and they said, hey, "Can we tell this guy to sh shut up or get out? <laughs> we want something kind of soothing, you know, simple." Well, anyway, that's how I started, and then I became a florist for a while. I worked in a knitting factory for a while. I'm just like uh, some of the pre people who are running for president now. He started, his father started out as a poor man. But anyway, I had a lot of fun in my early days, and it was really a great experience because I worked with some of the best musicians at that time. And I started writing music when I was about 14, writing band arrangements. And I did that, and then I went in the Navy, went to the Navy School of Music, and shipped out on an aircraft carrier for. I was in the Navy for four and a half years. It was really quite an experience because I got to meet a lot of, a lot of musicians and a lot of talented people that I never would have met otherwise. And I went overseas with a band and I became the instructor in the band. In fact, on an aircraft carrier, we had two chiefs and they were two bastards. No question about it. And, when, and they were telling me they were going to leave because they didn't like the band. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> and I said, well, then I went up there and I saw the captain. And the captain said, don't worry. You guys will be all right. We're going to take good care of you. And I stayed on the aircraft carrier. Became, I, was, I, I was in charge of the band. I did arrangements from those V-discs that we, they, we used to have. I used to take off arrangements you know, to, to supply um, the band with, with the Rangers. And I started writing and did a lot of writing. And I did that, and I finally left that and went back uh, to my hometown and became uh, a florist, and as I said, and I worked in a knitting factory. And then I couldn't stand that. I thought that was, it wasn't mundane, but it was just not me. I just, I was so frustrated. I had to be back in music. Nobody would hire me. So I said, to hell with them. If they don't want to hire me, I'm going to move out. And I left my father. One night, I took the apron off, threw it at him, said, I'm leaving, Dad. Uh, goodbye. And a couple of days later, I packed up the car. We headed off to New York. I enrolled at Juilliard, got, and they put me in the, the uh, diploma department. And I said, look, I'd like to get my degree. They said, well, you never finished high school. I said, that's true. I didn't finish high school. You have to go back now and get your Diploma, your, uh, what's it called? I guess it, I can't think of what the what they call it. War, war, war service diploma. So I went back and took all the all the tests, passed the tests, got my Regency certificate, and I was still at Julie. I changed my diploma to a degree course, and I started studying, uh, you know, conducting and, and working in the uh, labs up there. We had a lab that we used to make records, and I was getting 75 cents an hour to, to cut the masters. I used to know how to do all of that stuff and set up the bands, and, and it was a, a great experience for me. And then I changed my uh, major. They wouldn't let me change my major. They, they said, you can, you're going to have to take a test, uh, you know, and we're going to have to have a panel to hear your what you can do, what you can't do. And I, so the, I had one teach, two teachers there that grilled me day and night. And I went down and I took the test. I know I did very well, because they said you did very well. But the, one of the professors who was uh, an old funny daddy, he said, uh, ah, Mr. Masaru, you, but you're one of those. 
I said, well, what are, so I said, sir, what is, what are those? He said, well, you're a jazz musician. I said, well, what's that got to do with it? I want to become a composition major. I don't want to study saxophone. I can play it better when I came in than when I left, than what I, at, at the moment. And they said, they wouldn't let me change. So I said, well, the hell with you guys. So I started studying privately with Henry Brandt, and then I got a lot of other people involved. Then I applied for a Guggenheim, and they, I had Bernstein, Aaron Copeland, Walter Friedrich. I had 10 of the greatest American composers in the United States sponsoring me for a Guggenheim. So I got two Guggenheims. Meantime, I, I had left teaching, I was teaching blind children for a while, and the salary there was like $2,500 a year, and then they gave me a $450 raise. I'd like to work for you, Dr. Schroeder. You know, maybe I could make, <laughs> anyway, make a few extra bucks. But the point is that when I got the Guggenheim, I said, you know, I'm getting 2,900 and something. I said, it's really not worth it. I, so I told the woman who was in charge of the department that I didn't want to stay any longer. I wanted to really branch out and get involved with music. And then I met Mingus and met a lot of other people. And But as I was getting ready to leave, the woman said, look, we'll increase your salary to twenty uh, to, 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 to 4500 I said, well, it's too late now. I've made up my mind, and this is what I'm going to do. And I did. I pursue, pursued a, a musical career. Then I was giving concerts. I took the Guggenheim money that I had, and I was giving concerts all throughout New York City in various places, Town Hall, Cooper Union, any place that would give me all, I would hire the musicians, write the music, and do the concerts. And I had one great guy uh, at Cooper Union who was doing a weekly or monthly con series of concerts, and he said, Tia, we'd like you to write some music, you know, on a monthly basis for us. So, and he was a great conductor, and he, uh, he worked for NBC, and that's how I got started. And then finally, at the end of all of that, there was a guy named George Avakian who was then head of the uh, jazz department at Columbia Records, and he said to me at the end of the concert, would you like to work for Columbia? I said, well, what does it pay? He says, uh, uh, $90 a week. I said, $90 a week? I said, That's, well, where, do I, where, do we go? where do I start? He said, well, go see this guy tomorrow. And he said, and, and see if, if he likes you, you can become a music editor. And by that time, I was I could read I could read music fairly well, you know I could conduct it. So I took the job, I got the job, took it, and then I was making uh, after the first year I was making about eighteen thousand bucks a year, working overtime, night differential, and so forth. And then one of the guys uh, that was working downstairs in the A and R department said, "Tia, would you like to become a producer?" I said, Jesus, you know, uh, I'm making 18,000 bucks. I'm playing now. I'm writing music for this one and for that one. I said, what does it pay? He said, 7,500. I said, 7,500. I'm making 18,000. I said, but I'll take the job. I took the job, and within eight months to a year, I was making 25,000 bucks a year. And then I got a bonus, and then I got up to 30,000. And every time the president... He used to see me in the hall because I was working with him on Broadway shows. He said, Tio, oh, by the way, I gave you another 5000 or I gave you another $2,000. I said, uh, but I, sir, I said, I'd like to go to California. He said, look, it, I'll give you some more money. Don't go out there. Stay here with us because I was doing all the shows with him. I said, okay. And I ended up getting bonuses up to 50000 bucks a year. I think the highest bonus I ever received was 100000 so I was making a lot of money, and I had in my pockets, we didn't have credit cards in those days. I was making, uh, well, I, I, I was saying, making a great salary, had great bonuses, and any time I wanted any money at all, a thousand or two thousand dollars, that's all I had to do was to go upstairs to the 21st floor and sign a little voucher, and, and they, they would got a fifty dollar bills, two thousand dollars. I'd stick it in my pocket. He said, If you need any tickets, you want to go to Hollywood, want to go, he says, Just get the tickets and go. But then he said, You must, if anybody asks you, you're doing something for me, but stop in Las Vegas on the way back to see the various artists. And I used to do that, wine and dine them. 
And that's how I got started. I became a producer for CBS. I was there for, uh, I don't know, almost 30 years. And I made a few bucks. And now I don't have to work. So you don't have to pay me for today. <laughs> it was very interesting, you know, how I got Bernstein and, some of the, and Aaron Copeland and some of these other people. Because as a music editor, one of my responsibilities was to edit the tapes with the engineer. And we would do that with all the classical people, the pop people, and so forth. So you got to meet a whole gang of wonderful individuals. And I spent a lot of time, and I will tell you one story with Bernd Lenny, as I was working with him one night at the, uh, at, at, at one of the projects he was involved in, I said, uh, gee, you know, this is great, great for me to be here with you. And he said, look, come on, he said, I'm finished for the night. I want, to, I want to talk to you for a minute or two anyway. He said, look, I'm working on something. Do you think by tomorrow you could write me a piece? <laughs> I said, Lenny, I said, look, it, you're such a great composer. You don't need me to do anything. You've you got to be joking. He said, no. He said, I, I, I'm really stuck. I said, look, it, Lenny, you can do it. So I, the next day, night we were working together again. So he said, you know, you're right, I did it. I said, and by the way, what was the project? He said, there was one, I'm doing a Broadway show, and there was one jazz piece in there that I wanted you to do. I said, but did you do it? He said, yes, I did it. And it was West Side Story. <laughs> At that point, I almost fell, I almost fell down. And I, this happened with all the other people. Then I was, I was, it was just one after another. And now we worked with all the great uh, violinists. And so I, I had a lot of fun, you know, chemistry with these guys and working with them. And everything just worked out fine. Now, the, so far as when I became a producer, I was assigned, my first artist was Dave Brubeck. And Dave Brubeck, uh, my boss, said, look, at, tomorrow you're leaving for California. I said, geez, you know, I, I can't do that. I said, Tomorrow morning, you're leaving for California. First of all, you've got to meet Dave Brubeck at the hotel next door. Talk to him for a minute or two, and then get yourself a ticket and get out there, because you're going to do it in two or three days. So I did that. His first record was, I think it was called Gone with the Wind, which did extremely well. And then I got Miles to just about the same time. And then I had Duke Ellington. I had uh, all the jazz of, of Charlie Mingus. Thelonious Monk, John Lewis, uh, oh, uh, who was the other, there was, oh God, we did a record called Sun, Sun Goddess, and that, uh, that sold a million records. So I made one thing after another, and I did extremely well, and I had a lot of fun. And J.J. Johnson, we, I did all kinds of projects, and then was, as I said earlier, I was doing all the Broadway shows with the president, not only the not only the musicals, but we did all of the dialogue shows, like with Richard Burton, who did Camelot and so forth, and the subject was roses. And then there was one thing called Dylan, which was a, a big Broadway show. Alec Guinness was in it. Uh, the president said, "I don't like the music. We're going to record the show tomorrow. Now I want you to get out of here and write all the music for the for the for the record." I said. I said, Mr. Lieberson, I, you know, I'll be glad to do it. He says, you got to do it, and you got to do it right away. Now get out. <laughs> Go home. And so I went home, and I wrote all the music. And then we put it in after we had recorded the, uh, the tracks, I mean, the uh, dialogue. And it, one, one thing after another. So I had, a, I had a great time. 